Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we've got a great presentation for you. We're going to get started shortly. So yeah, just sit back, relax, um, and we will get started in about two minutes. Thank you for your patience, and thank you for logging in early. Appreciate that. Um, we've got a, as I said earlier, we've got a great presentation for you guys, and looking forward to uh, presenting it for everyone. So just hang tight. We've got uh, about a minute or so before we get started. Thank you. Oh, Emily, go on. Good morning, everyone. Again, thank you for waiting. We still have some people logging in. We're going to give it just a few more moments, and then we're going to get started. Thank you for joining us on a Monday morning. We appreciate your time, and we're going to get started very shortly. Thank you. Well, again, good morning. My name is Stephen Carrera, the Education Manager here at STOE, and I will be hosting this webinar somewhat. We've got a great presentation from Felix, Innovating for Tribology, Chapter 1, Introducing the Felix Multi-Context Tribology Tester. We've got two speakers today. We have Michael, uh, Michael Anderson and Dirk Treath, and I will be introducing them in a moment. But first, I need to go over a few admin issues. So if uh, you're having problems with the audio or um, other things like that, please give us a call and I will try my best to help you with that problem. And uh, you are all in listen only mode, so uh, you won't be able to use your microphone to ask questions, but we do have the question panel that we would like you to submit questions to. Using that, we will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So you can locate that um, as well as the chat panel. So Q&A, uh, the questions panel is where you want to throw your questions at the end of the presentation. This is also being recorded, and that recording will be sent out to everyone tomorrow. So look for that in your email tomorrow. All right. And uh, our first speaker we're going to hear from today is Michael Anderson. Uh, he is the area manager for Felix Corporation, as well as a past president of STLE. So we've known Mike for a long time and we're very excited to uh, hear from him today. And we're also going to hear from Dirk Chase, and he is the CEO of the Felix Tribology. Um, and he's got a lot of knowledge and uh, he's joining us from Europe. So uh, we appreciate his time in the evening. And without uh, Further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our speakers.
All right. Mike, please take it away. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're having a good Monday morning and hope it will be better after our presentation. Good morning and welcome. Today's presentation is Innovating for Tribology, Chapter 1, Introducing the Felix Multi-Contact Tribology Test here, MCTT for short. And we've introduced this as Chapter 1 because this kind of indicates that we will have in the future, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, maybe Chapter 4, and so forth, introducing new innovative test machines coming from Felix Corporation. And we'll have more of that at the end of this presentation. Stefan, can you help me advance the slide here, please? Ah, okay, so again, welcome this morning to Felix Corporation. We'd like to welcome you to our facility virtually here today. Innovating today for tomorrow's solutions. But first, a word from our president, Tom Peterson. Hello, I'm Tom Peterson, president of Felix Corporation. Thank you for taking time today to attend our webinar introducing the Felix MCTT, the Felix Multi Contact Tribology Tester. Felix continues to build on a rich history of manufacturing tribology instruments and working as a corporate partner with STLE. As our 93rd year of business comes to a close, we continue to innovate tribology instruments using lessons we've learned from the past. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Okay, uh, chapter one here is introducing the multi-contact tribology tester, the MCTT. The early development history began in 1967 with the development of the thrust washer tester, the LFW-6 in industry. And this was used for looking at materials used in journal bearings, for evaluating plastics for rate of wear and PV limits, and also for greases containing solid particles, such as self-lubricating materials such as Teflon. In 1976, Felix acquires the uh, LFW-6 thrust washer tester. It was basically a very simple device, just designed basically for running a thrust washer test. 1978, Robert Wojtek, working with Felix, redesigns the test machine into the Felix multi-specimen, or simply this Felix Model 6. Realizing industry's need for a versatility in testing, he began designing adapters with different tribological conditions. Sadly, we lost Bob this year, uh, early on in April, but he had been affiliated with Felix for 30 years, designing world-class tribology test equipments for us. He was a good friend to me, an incredible mentor over the years, a good friend, and I miss him very much. This is the model that Bob developed back in 1978, which took a very simple one-piece device and turned it into something that could actually be programmed. Um, you could change the speeds, change the loads, increase the capacity of the testing, and it became a much more versatile tribology test machine through the use of additional easily changeable adapters. In 2019, this is what the equipment looked like. And as you can see, it is fully computerized for both programming, control, and data acquisition. In 2020, we introduce the Felix multi-contact tribology tester. And these both pictures are to scale. So what I really like you to take a note here is it uses a lot less of real estate in the laboratory. It is a little slightly less than one fourth 
the amount of real estate needed to use the, the MCTT tester. A little close up of the, uh, of the uh, test area, you can see the dual opposing shafts. This is the area right here where the uh, adapters get put in. And of course, everything is controlled through the touch screen. This is a little close up, but it's really right over here. And you can call up old test procedures. You can develop new test procedures. There's pre-programmed ASTM standards, and there's also the data acquisition real-time display while the test is running and data stored in CSV format. So again, notice the size savings. It's, uh, it's remarkable that this whole machine now fits into this one compact unit. So the MCTT is based on the Felix multi-specimen test machine. It has a smaller footprint, less than one quarter of the lab space required for this apparatus. It has a wide range of load speeds and temperature, uses Felix shared electronics platform. And this has helped us to greatly reduce the cost of the equipment. So it makes it more affordable to get this into your laboratories. Again, microprocessor control test parameters, rate selectable data collection with high speed capabilities, and the data is stored in a CSV format with Excel compatibility. It is the best value for precise, accurate, and tri tribology testing. This tester can test in point line and area contacts. It has a wide range of loads from 45 to 3600 newtons. Contact pressures from 0.1 megapascals to 10 gigapascals. And you can see in this little chart the range of those pressures based on the different adapters. Speeds from 10 to 3600 RPM. We can have oil recirculation, heating and cooling options, multiple applications, and low cost customization. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple slides. The testing possibilities include lubricants, greases, materials, metallic and non-metallic, plastics, ceramics, composites, and all of these can be tested in lubricated and unlubricated conditions. We can also uh, look at wear rates and friction properties of surfaces, either bonded film lubricants, coatings such as titanium nitride, diamond-like carbon coatings, and also surface texturing. Versatile simplicity through adapters. This is the main benefit of this test machine that we can introduce and the user can bring up different types of tribological conditions simply by changing an adapter and using different contacting pieces. Standard adapters are listed here. We also have adapters to meet customer requirements. And these are listed separately because in many cases, each of these test pieces, for example, the bottles used in the sliding bottle test, are different for each particular uh, testing laboratory. So we work with our clients to develop the right sized adapters to accommodate their test pieces. And many customized application specific adapters can be developed for specific needs of your tribology testing. Now, join us at Felix Tribology NV, our research facility in Belgium, for a demonstration of direct test applications using this new machine, the Felix MCTT. Welcome, my name is Dirk Drees, and I'm here standing in front of one of our tribological testing laboratories in Belgium where we address a lot of different practical issues related to tribology for industry. Let's have a look around. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, all right, so there I am, unmuted. Um, thank you, Mike, for handing over the word to me. And uh, as I showed in a very short uh, movie introduction there, we're having a laboratory in Belgium with a number of different test machines and using a lot of uh, these different test machines for different applications. Today in this webinar, we will focus a little bit on the applications we developed with the Felix multi-specimen previously and MCTT machine today. So jumping into a couple of applications now, let me see if I can move these slides. Yes, there we go. Uh, first group of applications that I wanna show a few examples of are point contacts. Um, we already said it's easy to put adapters into this machine and to create different geometries. So one group of geometries of tribological contacts could be point contact. And you see a few examples here of adapters that can hold such point contacts. We have a three ball holder here that can slide over a large ring. We also have a special holder here that can hold a sheet, a flat sheet, and then we can slide a ball over it. I will show this example in the next slide. And this is an application where we are using the geometry of a four ball configuration, but except for the three lower balls, we are using three small flat disks that we hold in a holder. And that allows us to do four ball type of testing, but with alloys that can maybe not easily be found as test balls. So just a few examples, and the ones we look a little bit closer at here are a deep drawing test, which is a ball on this configuration, and a high-speed galling test. Moving the slide here. So the deep drawing test, uh, we worked on that and we developed that in cooperation with partners in a European project. And the objective was to simulate on a lab scale uh, the friction that you might encounter in the formation processes. So there's not only sliding friction, there's also deformation of uh, metals or sheets going on. And uh, the idea was to look at the effect of different parameters and rank and oil. Examples that we did in the European project uh, were among others uh, for the car industry, steel sheet, and for consumer products. And these were stainless steel sheets. And this is how we approach this. Um, up here on the left-hand side, you see the lower adapter that we use to clamp a sheet metal, like this one, into a holder here that has a recess below the sheet. And because there's a recess, when we press on this sheet, it is allowed to deform under a load. Now here in the video, you see a ball that's been in contact, was brought in contact with the sheet. It's pressing on the sheet and we are slowly rotating. While we rotate, we measure the frictional torque. So we're measuring friction while at the same time deforming or allowing a deformation of the sheet. And after a test, sheet may look like this on uh, the left-hand side in this image. And you can see that it's been deformed during the test. When we're doing tests like this, it is possible to make uh, graphs that uh, look like this one, where we plot the coefficient of friction, or to put it more accurately, uh, the resistance against the sliding and the deformation at the same time. And we plot it against the sliding speed that we used. And we can do this for different oils at different temperatures. In this graph, we have all 40 degrees. And in this graph, we have done them all at 80 degrees. And then from these kind of uh, measurements, you can see trends or you can see uh, behavior developing. Uh, for instance, the oil A is blue shaded in this graph. And at the different speeds, you see uh, the value of the coefficient of friction. As we go to 80 degrees, you see that the coefficient of friction has increased in all these conditions. Whereas this is not so much the case with the oils that are coded green here, oil B. You see that. The differences between 40 and 80 degrees are not that obvious. So this allows us to uh, rank and to pre-screen oils and see how their behavior will be with increasing temperatures and with increasing speeds. And this can then again be used to improve the formulation of oils or to look at the effects of uh, finish on the sheets, roughness and, and etc. texture, etc. 
This is a second um, point contact project that we did. And in this one, we wanted to simulate galling. Galling is an adhesive wear mechanism. It's a very severe wear mechanism when you have very high contact pressures between, for instance, two metals. Um, you will get welding and you will get uh, destruction of your surface. And the objective that we had with our testing was to look at galling, particularly at a high speed motion. And we did this by using an upper adapter here. This adapter is holding the three pins uh, that I've shown earlier in an earlier slide. And we are compressing it and sliding it at high speed against a lower disc. Now on this side, we have an uncoated disc. And I don't know if it's going to be visible to everybody. We have uh, reduced the speed on the video, but sometimes you see some sparks appearing there. And these sparks indicate that there's been actual metallic welding and these welds have broken and you get uh, very hot metal ejected from the contact there. On the right hand side is the same experiment, but it is with a coated disc, a coating that is of course uh, intended to reduce this galling problem. And there you will not see these sparks appearing. So it gives the first indication that the coating is doing what it's supposed to do. Now the story is a little bit more complicated than just that. When we look at the online measurements of coefficient of friction, and we compare the uncoated and the coated discs, you can see that the uncoated disc has in fact, after a while, a lower coefficient of friction than the coated one. And um, as the test progresses and the load progresses, we even have a point where the coefficient of friction of the uncoated disc is dropping even further. But that doesn't mean that there is no wear or no damage occurring. And you can see this in this lower graph. In the lower graph, we are following the, um, the total displacement of the system. And that is an indication of macroscopic wear. So we could call this a wear curve. It's a little bit simplified, but for the purpose of this uh, slide, we can call that the wear. And here you can see that the uncoated system definitely wears in a lot more than the coated system from the beginning of the test. And actually, once the load increases to higher uh, values, the wear is just increasing, where right? this is not the case with the coated system. So we find that the coated system is actually doing the job it was intended to do. Good. Uh, these were point contacts. A second large group and very important group of contacts in industry are line contacts. Uh, line contacts occur in a lot more components and, and applications than pure sliding point contacts, um, mainly because it, it's just a better tribological contact. You are distributing your load over a larger line, a larger area, so contact pressures are more moderate. And also when you have inhomogeneous materials, then uh, a line contact is also distributing the tribological contact over a larger area. In this way, kind of averaging the properties of the different phases or the different uh, components of a surface. And it's again, very easy, as Mike already introduced, it's very easy to set up the machine to execute a line contact. We can place uh, disks of different shapes and sizes in the bottom of the machine on the table. And we can use a holder or an adapter to hold three veins, three rectangular counter materials like that, and just hold them, align them very well, and slide them over the surface. I will show an example of this uh, in the next slide. I also already want to introduce another type of line contact. Whereas this one on the top would be a pure sliding contact. The one on the bottom, here we want to create a roll sliding contact. And we do this by using a holder of this shape that is holding two cylinders that are allowed to rotate around their own axis in this holder. So they have some freedom to rotate around their own cylindrical axis. And then when you put this holder in between as it were two sandwiches that rotate around and that have a specific shape 
like this, then you are creating on the same at the same time a rolling and a slip or sliding uh, component. So we're showing two applications that we uh, evaluated with this kind of line contacts. The first one is a challenge that we uh, addressed a, a while ago and that we have now uh, uh, completely developed. It's the simulation of a Conestoga or Vickers vein pump test. These tests are um, component tests for hydraulic oils. They are focused on the anti-wear properties of hydraulic fluids. The downside of these tests that happen in a test stand like this on the left, the downside is that these tests take a very long to run and require a lot of oil. The ASTM test takes 100 hours. The ISO test even takes 250 hours. So it's an expensive test, both in cost and in time consumption. And it would be nice to have a laboratory scale test that can predict or pre-screen oils for this component test. We have developed this test. And if you like more details about that, uh, it's probably best to contact us after the webinar. There's a lot of publications and, and presentations about all the details. And so here, I just want to very quickly show how we run the test on an MCTT. So again, it's fairly easy to set up this test. We have a little bit of a special bottom specimen that we placed on the bottom table. Maybe I'm going a little bit too quickly here. We place it on the bottom table. We connect a thermocouple to it. And then we place our upper holder with three special veins. We bring everything together in a recirculating system and we recirculate an oil. And by doing this and developing the parameters and setting the parameters just right, we can run a test that simulates the wear that also happens in the Conestoga test. And now after a test, we can measure the weight losses of these three veins and of the bottom sample. And we can uh, compare these weight losses with typical Conestoga wear test results. And um, the results were very promising. That's why we developed this method, of course. Um, in this graph on the left-hand side, you see in blue the results we got from our MCTT test. Uh, this is the weight losses for five different hydraulic fluids. And in red, you see the results from this uh, Conestoga ASTM or ISO test. And when we rank the results now from least wear to highest wear, we are actually getting an, um, an identical ranking between the two methods. So we have A, D, B, E, and C. And um, as you see on the blue, we have uh, we have error bars. So we have actually results from repeat tests here. It's not just a single number. So both methods are giving the same ranking, which means that the method is relevant. Um, we also find quite good repeatability between repeat tests. So we have a repeatable method. And if necessary, um, I haven't mentioned this before, but the the MCTT test is only taking 22 hours in contrast to the 100 hours ASTM test. So it makes it possible to run a few duplicate tests and still have your results faster than with a single Conestoga test. The method can be adapted. We can run longer uh, durations if we want to improve separation. But already, it's a very good uh, result a test that predicts or pre-ranks the uh, Conestoga vein pump test. Um, an extra work that we did on this uh, procedure is looking at the sensitivity of the test method. And for that, we uh, formulated three oils. They're all the same base oil, but we've added uh, an anti-wear additive in very small amounts, 0.2%, 0.4, and 0.6. So you see, these are actually quite small percentages of an additive. Even so, when we run the test, we can see a clear difference between the 0.2 and the 0.6, the 0.4 being somewhere in the middle. On the top, you see the wear damage on the veins, or one of the veins, and you see with 0.6, actually no more wear damage visible. On the bottom, we see the wear damage on the disc, on the lower disc, and this is also evolving from some damage 
to less damage to almost no damage. And when we plot these results, uh, the weight losses that we measured, you can see in this particular case that the concentration of additive by adding it, we get to a point where there's actually very little weight, um, wear and very little weight loss. Also interesting in this method, and this is something you don't get from the Conestoga uh, component test, we can measure the coefficient of friction uh, during the test. And you can see in this particular case that adding an anti-wear additive doesn't necessarily change anything to the coefficient of friction. But of course, you could also use this methodology to now start to evaluate friction additives. And if you would like to reduce the friction, so the energy losses in a pump system, you could add friction modifiers. And with this method, you could evaluate whether these friction modifiers are indeed reducing your friction. So the method is very sensitive to even very small additive concentrations. Right. The second line contact uh, example we wanted to show were these roll slide uh, contacts. And uh, there's quite some roll slide contacts in industry um, possible. The one we focused on was a rack and pinion mechanism, um, which was an actuator in the aerospace industry to opening and closing uh, the slats of an, uh, an airplane wing. And um, in such a contact, which is a little bit like a gear contact, you have both a rolling and a sliding component in the contact. So we wanted to evaluate the effect of coatings or uh, the effect of a lubricant on this kind of roll sliding mechanism. And of course, we then want to simulate it in a roll sliding motion. So here again, you see this holder, this special holder I showed earlier on with two cylinders in it. And in this case, this is after a test, you will see some wear particles and some debris. And this would be the lower plate and you have an almost similar upper plate. And these two plates, this is where these rollers are being sandwiched in between. And this is what it looks like once it's set up in the machine. Uh, we have the, the upper shaft rotating the upper driver right here. And then we have this part which is rolling and sliding over the bottom plate. So this is what's happening because it's a rack and pinion mechanism that goes back and forth or reciprocates. We've chosen also to run the test in a reciprocating motion. So the machine is perfectly capable of doing both unidirectional sliding and reciprocating sliding. So we can use both uh, speed profiles as well. Going to some results then. There we go. Oh, one too many clicks. Please bear with me, go back. There we go. Um, picking up the coefficient of friction um, and comparing coated and uncoated rollers or cylinders, you can immediately see the effect of the coating on, uh, on this uh, tribal contact. The uncoated rollers in red are giving us absolute values of coefficient of friction, which are significantly higher, 0.04 compared to the coated rollers, which are just over 0.02. So effectively halving the uh, friction and thus also energy losses by coating these rollers. Um, another part of the study was to look at the effect of contamination on the lubrication of this, uh, of this system. And in this system, we didn't use coated rollers. We just used uncoated steel versus steel uh, contacts. When we do a test unlubricated, which is of course not uh, what you're supposed to do, but you get a reference value, you get about eight milligrams of wear loss in that case. When we did the test with the um, aerospace uh, specified grease, we are finding less than two milligrams of wear, which is also as expected. You lubricate your contact so you get less wear. But when we tested with some greases that were taken from uh, different airplanes as samples and which were contaminated with sand, we saw an immediate effect on the wear or the wear rate 
we get almost 10 times as much wear as an even unlubricated contact. Um, this is not very surprising because the grease plus the sand is forming something like an abrasive paste. And now we are moving into an abrasive wear mechanism. And as long as you have abrasive parts, the wear just goes on. But it highlights or it illustrates the need to control the contamination or avoid the contamination in this particular roll slide contact. Trying to get to the next slide. Here we go. Um, using this roll slide test, we can use them in different ways. Uh, here is an example, and I have to apologize for the uh, quality of the image. It's an older image, and we uh, we couldn't find a newer one anymore. But the objective here was uh, to evaluate um, the possibility of pitting uh, damage and uh, avoiding pitting damage by lubricants. So we are using a slightly different shape of uh, lower sample. And on this lower sample, you are also going to create a roll and a slide component because you have a difference in radius where these cylinders are moving over. And if you do this uh, under the right set of parameters and for a long enough duration, then in some cases, you may find that the surface is getting damaged by pitting, so more by a fatigue damage than an actual sliding or um, uh, sliding damage. And in this way, you can start to look at different lubricants, uh, whether they prevent pitting or not. You can look at uh, material delamination and surface fatigue. So it turns into a, a bit more of a combination of tribology and fatigue testing, surface fatigue testing. So that's another uh, option with this roll slide line contact. All right, the third category are area contacts. And area contacts are also very interesting uh, to consider because as you increase your area, you're going to further decrease the contact pressure in a lab test. And uh, again, there are a lot of industrial uh, situations where the contact pressures aren't very, very high. And I will illustrate uh, the use of the machine with two examples. One is a powder friction test, which is the upper example here. And one is an uh, area contact, lower sample or lower um, uh, picture here. So the first one, powder friction. Why did we look at the friction of powders? Well, because powders have to sometimes have a, a lubricating quality um, by themselves. And so we want to measure the friction of a powder one way or another. In some cases, like in this example, you actually want the friction to be quite high. So it's important to be able to measure the friction of powder under different sets of conditions and also to check the repeatability of the method. And so the method we have for powder friction testing consists really of two steps. First, we have a lower holder or a lower recipient where we have to apply the powder. And we have to take care that we apply this powder in a repeatable way. So we are filling this adapter carefully without any gaps, without any air pockets. And then we apply a weight for a certain time to compress the powder to a certain condition. And this we do, of course, always in the same way. When we've prepared the lower holder like that, we can easily place it in the test machine. You see this takes seconds. And we put a, an upper counter material against this bed of powder and we can start rotating. As we rotate, some of the powder will be uh, expelled from the contact, so it's never a very long test. But during the cycles that we have powder to upper, uh, uh, to upper holder contact, we pick up the friction. And then the upper slider is uh, shown here in this. Uh, it's a steel slider with a certain surface finish. And then going to the set of results. I have to click once more. There we go. No, one too many clicks again. So in this graph, we look at the difference between two graphites. They were delivered to us by uh, a client and they were just known, uh, known as graphite A and graphite B. And uh, 
graphite A in the red colors, graphite B in the blue colors, and you can see a very significant, very uh, large difference in their frictional behavior. Um, whether you want high friction or low friction depends on your applications, of course. I can imagine that if you want to use graphite uh, as a lubricant to reduce friction in a certain components, you would like to have this behavior of your graphite powder. In this graph, you can also see how repeatable uh, these tests can be if you do them in the right way. And then when we have this, we can take this steady state friction as a value for the different powders, and we can plot different powders uh, and the coefficient of friction of these different powders and compare them with each other. Uh, one of them you saw in the little video, the last one, I believe, was ground coffee. And you can see that you know, coffee grains might lubricate just as well as graphite. Just a little tip for you at home. So this was an area contact, but you can also uh, put uh, bulk materials in area to area contacts. Um, there are a lot of different applications where the contacts are actually areas. And so we would simulate them also in the test method with an area contact. Maybe the best known area contact method is the ASTM D3702, which was also already mentioned by Mike in the introduction. Um, it's a method where you are using a, a fixed geometry of a ring on top of uh, another ring, so a trust washer uh, contact. And you look at the wear rate of materials under fixed conditions. You can also search for PV limits. And of course, um, we wouldn't be ourselves if we hadn't modified that method a little bit for some customers. And uh, this modified method you can see in this little video. Um, the upper sample is this ring up here. I will pause the video for a second if I can. So I can point at it. Oh, I can't pause it. Um, what you see here is the adapter that holds the actual counter material. The counter material is situated down here. It's a ring of steel. And then our lower sample is, uh, in this case, a composite material that uh, was not easy or it wasn't possible to manufacture in the shape of a ring. But this is no problem because we can just fix this sample to another ring on our machine. And we can do a test similar to a trust washer test on different materials. So once again, this is how uh, you set it up quite easily. You run the test for a predetermined amount of uh, time cycles, load, and so on. And after a test, easy to take uh, the samples apart and to evaluate them. Now with this test, you see a very shallow wear track or a shallow uh, change of the surface. It's not possible to measure the wear in uh, terms of weight losses in this case, but we have uh, quite powerful three-dimensional microscopy available for us. And so we can look at the effect of this test on the surface. You can see in this case, there is a smoothening of the material. Maybe there's deformation, maybe there's been some wear um, that needs to be evaluated in further study. So the modified method also consisted of changing the load, which is easy to do. You just program the machine to do it after X amount of uh, seconds. You increase your load to the next level and you just run the test automatically. So this is all run automatically and the result in this case, we could evaluate whether the coefficient of friction changes significantly as we increase load. And for this specific material, the answer was no. Coefficient of friction remains stable. This was not the case for every material, I might add. So the advantage on this test machine of measuring uh, online the torques, the loads, and the temperatures is also that we can follow a test quite easily. We can evaluate at what point a material or a tribological contact starts to fail. This is an example of that. In this example, we also modified the thrust washer geometry a little bit. You see this lower, hold, uh, this lower uh, specimen. 
And in this lower specimen, we made some extra grooves in the surface to enable a lubricant to more easily wet the contact area, which is this ring around here. And then running the test after a certain amount of time, now it's expressed in hours, so after about four hours, there is a sudden change in the mechanism. We see an increase of the friction, which is the blue curve right here. And at the same time, we see that the bottom specimen where we measure temperature is starting to heat up as a result of this frictional input. And we see even in the load signal up here, uh, a little bit of noise appearing. And this is because there is so much change to the surface here that uh, it, it's not a smooth surface anymore and the whole system starts to vibrate a little bit. So we're picking up everything at the same time and that tells us that at this point the lubrication has really collapsed. Uh, just a few examples of uh, a little bit of add-ons or options let's say. It's uh, quite uh, easy to cool the area where we are testing, for instance, with this cooling jacket right here. This is a, a double-walled uh, double uh, cup that goes around the testing area, and we can flow water through it to cool it down to uh, water temperature, or we can, cool, um, we can flow uh, cooled ethanol or glycol through it and get it even colder. So it's, it all fits on the machine, it's all made uh, to standard sizes, so it's easy to put on and, and take off again. And here's an example where we put a recirculation cup on the system. Uh, this is an example where we were testing fuel as a lubricant, and uh, it's very important to recirculate the fuel so it doesn't overheat, because if it overheats, this is what happens. It's a total breakdown of the tribological contact and we get some smoke and uh, overheating. Right, so these were a number of examples of different groups of, um, of contacts and I hope it gives you a little bit of uh, inspiration. And uh, at this point, I just want to give my uh, my word back to Mike Anderson, who can summarize our webinar of today. Back to you, Mike. Thanks, Derek. Uh, that was pretty amazing. And that's just a small, minuscule amount of capabilities that this machine can do. So just to kind of summarize, again, point line area contacts, loads. I think Dirk also showed that it can run in unidirection as well as uh, reciprocating motion. Contact pressure, speeds, oil recirculation, very, very versatile test machine. It uses cost efficient adapters and options that are easy, easily interchangeable. We do not use complex modules. One of the benefits of adapters is that each time you change the adapter and, and put it back to where it was before, it is in the exact same place. So this increases this machine's repeatability and reproducibility. We can simulate a wide variety of tribal conditions and applications for many different industries and applications. And above all, your creativity. This machine is the perfect tool to take your creativity and get meaningful test results. This device has almost unlimited capabilities, precision, efficiency, and value. Reduced laboratory development time, plus simple to use tribological adapters, plus smaller quantity of test fluid, equals faster results and lower testing costs. And it is available now. At this time, I'd like to invite you in advance to our next webinar through STLE. It's chapter two, and it will feature the next in our generation, our new generation of wear testers. Please join us or plan to join us on February 10th for this next uh, presentation, this chapter two. On behalf of the entire Felix group of partners, I wish to thank you for your attendance and we'll entertain questions now. And if your questions are proprietary or you wish to keep them in confidence, or you just think of them later on, you can contact Dr. Dirk Dries 
at his email listed on the screen in front of you. He's on Belgian time, just to let you know, or myself at uh, the email address listed below. So again, thank you for attending and hope this has been informative for you. And if any questions, please let us know. Thanks again. Back to you, Stefan. All right. Well, thank you, Mike and Dirk. That was a great presentation. Um, uh, we, have any we have a couple of questions here, so I'm just going to run through a few of them. Oops. Okay, so uh, will the slides be available after the presentation? Um, well, this is being recorded, so you will get a recording. Um, Mike and Dirk, are we able to send out the uh, the presentation? Fine. Yes. Okay. So, uh, if you would like uh, a copy of the slides, please um, email Dirk or Mike Anderson, and uh, they will uh, be able to get them to you. Or I can send them out. We'll Mike and uh, Dirk. We can discuss that afterwards. Um, so we have another question. Stefan, aren't there a couple questions? Yep, yep, I'm getting to them right now. Um, and so uh, how does one apply the oil in your metal forming application? That's a question. Yes, uh, it's a very good question. Um, initially, what we did was uh, apply a surplus of oil. Now, we know that in the forming industry, you are uh, adding just a little bit of oil, the minimum amount necessary to make the system work. And when you calculate it, it uh, turns out to be a couple of milligrams per square meter or grams per square meter. This is a little bit more difficult to do on the lab scale, but it's not impossible. But for the testing the, uh, that we have done so far, we've used an excess of oil, but just by dipping it or by brushing the oil onto the surface. And uh, by using an excess of oil, it means that we eliminate any cases where we might run into a, a little spot of starvation of the oil. Um, but it's indeed something that once you get to um, a further stage of pre-screening for a particular application, um, you, you may want to put as much oil on the test in the laboratory as you have um, in, in the industry, as you have in the industrial application. But it can be, it can be sprayed on, it can be brushed on. Um, if it has to be very little, maybe you can have the disc uh, spinning and put a drop in the middle and let it spin by centrifugal force and distribute by centrifugal force. So there's a couple of different ways that you can apply the lubricant. Okay, and um, what is the max test temperature capability of the MCTT? Uh, well, the machine is rated for um, about 200 degrees Celsius. Um, when we use a cup with insulation around it, we might go a little bit higher for tests that don't take too long. The main limitation is really in uh, in uh, the seals and in the bearings of the spindle. So if you can keep the spindle cool, uh, you can go a little bit higher, but typically 200 to 250 degrees would be would be the maximum for this machine. Okay, and are arbitrary velocity profiles possible? Arbitrary velocity profiles. Um, not in the software as it is. Uh, you have to remember that this machine is built um, to reduce cost and is built on a common platform of software. Um, what you can do is program steps with different velocities. So you can do step number one with a certain velocity. You can jump to step number two with a different velocity. So if, if it is meant uh, in that way, you can do different velocities in one test. Yeah, sure, and that is no problem. An arbitrary velocity profile, if, however, if, the, if that means that you can do sine waves or square waves of velocity and things like that, um, that's a little bit more advanced and, and that's not 
the direct uh, objective of this test machine. So it depends a little bit with what is uh, what is meant by by this uh, velocity profiles. Yeah, I'm not sure it's meant by yeah. arbitrary. So I guess we would have to maybe uh, get in contact with the uh, person who made the question to truly understand what kind of a speed profile he's looking at. Yeah. So sure, contact us direct, and uh, we talk a little bit more in detail about what you what you're thinking of. Okay. Great. Um, in the roll sliding test, can you vary the rolling sliding ratio? No, is the short answer. <laughs> um, the roll slide ratio can be changed by the geometry, uh, but it is fixed or it is determined by the geometry. That means the difference between the inner and the outer concentric rings that you have seen versus the radius of the cylinder, uh, this determines how much slip roll ratio you would have. Now, the advantage of this adapter is that you don't need to operate the, the cylinder. You don't have to drive the cylinder with a separate motor. Um, so it, it, um, it's a small adapter that can do it by itself, but it will be a certain fixed ratio between slip and um, between roll and slip. Yes. It's also interesting to note, Derek, that the inner and outer lands on that gear cam contact assembly have different roll slide ratios. Right. And when, and when you use a matching upper and lower in the in the walking cam on the center line you have pure rolling and as you go further out on the edge of the rollers you get an increase in the amount of sliding so some of that is also listed in a paper that was written uh, by felix uh, a while back and we can send anybody who's interested a copy of that paper so that they can have a under better understanding of that of that roll to slide ratio right but it doesn't go as far as, uh, as uh, for instance, uh, a mini traction machine where the disc and the ball are independently driven by a motor. But then for that machine, the objective is to create strideback curves. With this machine and with these adapters, the objective is to do longer term uh, wear tests as well as friction tests. Okay. So how do you calibrate in a... Coast POS, do you use a standard? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Yeah, how do you calibrate in a POS, Coast? Do you Coast. use a standard? Calibrate the machine, you mean? The parameters of the machine? I think he's asking how do you calibrate the coefficient of friction? Oh, okay. That that, that uh, <laughs> just cut out of the value. How do you calibrate the coefficient of friction? Well, you calibrate the torque sensor, the torque sensor that picks up the frictional torque on the lower table. And you do this by uh, hanging a dead weight to the sensor with a, with a certain uh, construction. So you calibrate the torque, you know the distance from the center to your wear track, and you also calibrate the normal force with a a calibrated force sensor that you place in between the table and the upper spindle. And you compress uh, you compress this force sensor and you verify that the load that you are applying is indeed the same as what you are measuring. And then you have all the three parameters necessary to calculate the coefficient of friction. You have the torque and the radius, which gives you the friction force. And you have the normal force or the normal load. And you divide the friction force by the normal force and you get your coefficient of friction. So the parameters that constitute the coefficient of friction are being calibrated. And then the coefficient of friction is only a mathematical calculation. Okay. And I believe a follow-up from that question, do you see any additional friction from your rig? Uh, no, because the friction is being picked up by a system that does not move. So there is no parasitic friction, if that is what uh, people are talking about. If you, if you would pick up the friction through 
a bearing or through a system that moves, then you might have some parasitic friction from that. That is not the case on our machine. Uh, the torque, the frictional torque is picked up direct on the lower table and the lower table doesn't rotate, it doesn't move. So the answer, short answer is no. Okay. Um, so for the Vickers vein pump testing, yeah. given the confidence intervals, can you really rank the multiple tests? Well, I think we can rank them better than Conestoga test results, because if you remember that slide, um, the red bars were only one single measurement, which has, in principle, no confidence. Um, what we did was uh, we ran at least two, sometimes three, sometimes even four repeat tests with the same oils, and then we get the the spread that you saw in that graph. I think the important thing there too to note is that the average cost to run a Vickers pump stand is extremely expensive. I think it's somewhere over ten thousand dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Um, well, depends a bit on uh, on uh, the parameters, but we we run it at about seven thousand euros. So that's yeah, that's eight thousand dollars. And I know some laboratories are asking uh, and are able to get more money for that. I would I would like to find out how they do that. Uh, but yeah, then this test, which lasts for about twenty two hours and is using less expensive specimens and is using a lot less oil. Um, we can run it at less than half of that cost. The main advantage is uh, the reduction of oil because now you can run this pre-screening, you can run this ranking test on some research oils, which are typically produced in laboratories and in volumes of a few liters maximum. Whereas for the Conestoga test, you know, they, they have to ship you a drum of oil. So you also have to produce a drum of oil. And it's not so easy to do that on, on the research or on the, for, on the formulation level. But it's really a big advantage there for the formulators to get an, at least the first indication whether their formulation and their additives are working before they put it in this expensive component test. So that, that's the main objective of this test method. So they can I also may add something. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. If I also may add something to that uh, comment, sometimes we see that the fluctuation can be higher, but we should also consider that the sensitivity of this method is also higher than the Conestoga, where you just get a um, weight loss after 250 or 100 hours. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the more data that you have, the higher the fluctuation that you will have. Yeah. At, so at this moment, this method is more meant for development and research rather than QC quality control. Uh, but I can see that as we as we develop more data on this and also go into the direction of a round robin exercise uh, within the foreseeable future, uh, we might uh, we might increase the confidence and the and the repeatability of this method even further. But at this moment, it is mostly intended or formulators, researchers to, to help them formulate before they have to commit to a $10,000 or an $8,000 component test, just price for one single test. So that's the idea. Okay. Um, in the test that showed where in the coded versus uncoded materials, how is it that where decreased over time with the coded material? Where decreased over time. Yeah, I, I, I don't have the graph uh, uh, perfectly in mind, but it could be that we have a bit of uh, thermal, thermal expansion of the whole system there. What thermal expansion does, it, it presses the two materials away from each other, if you can imagine it like that. So this wear sensor, now we have to go a little bit into detail what this wear sensor does. The wear sensor follows the vertical displacement of the lower table. And so when you apply a certain load to the system, you get your sensor in a certain position. And then as the materials are wearing down, the table has to move up a little bit to compensate for that. 
But at the same time, when your system or when your uh, contacts get hotter and there is some thermal expansion, it may be that the table is pushed down a little bit. And so when there is not much wear going on, but there is some, some heating up, you may see that you get what looks like negative wear. Uh, so this wear sensor don't, we, I, I prefer to call it a displacement sensor that gives an indication of what happens to the wear, but it's not an absolute value of wear. You shouldn't use it in that way. It also indicates when you, when you get a severe change in the tribological contacts causing extreme wear, that will be very, very directly indicated on the uh, uh, displacement sensor. That's all. Yeah, and it can be very uh, efficiently used when you're looking for PV limits of polymers, for instance, uh, while you are increasing pressures and, and uh, velocities you will see that the wear doesn't change much until suddenly it wears a lot. And that's then your PV point. So, so this is the way to use that wear sensor. You have to have a little bit of background in what's really happening in your particular contact there. Okay. All right. Um, so a few more. Can the area contact test be used as a TCT test? to evaluate different lubricants. You're talking twist compression test, the TC, uh, twist compression test, TCT test. Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, it is also an area uh, to area contact test that we can do at low velocity. Um, if you look in the literature for the typical TCT tests, however, uh, they are using larger samples and much higher loads. So um, that's a different machine. That's a very heavily loaded machine that is being used for those tests. Having said that, we have, um, we have tried to do TCT tests on our machine with smaller area samples. And uh, we were having some promising results with that. So you can do a type of TCT test with this system. You just have to be aware that we have a smaller or a, a lighter load limitation. And for that reason, you would have to use smaller area contact, smaller samples. But yes, it's possible in that sense. All right. Um... Are the loads applied electromechanically or by using dead weights? Neither. <laughs> the load is applied by a pneumatic system, so by air pressure. Right. And um, what is the dispersion level of results from Hester? I didn't understand that question. I don't either. Um, it, if you can clarify your question, um, please send it back in. Um, so one more question um, here. Can the powder test be used for abrasive wear measurements? Um, it would it would be difficult because in this um, in this setup with the cup that we have, we get some ejection of the powder out of the contact, and so most of the powder would be pushed out before you have any measurable wear. Now we have done in the past, and I, I couldn't show everything in our slides, but we have done an abrasive test with this machine in a little bit of a different way, um, where we are moving a slider or uh, something like a wiper over a disc, and we are constantly providing abrasive powder into the contact. Uh, the trick with an abrasive test is that you have to apply abrasive particles in a repeatable and in a constant way, in a constant flow. Uh, so, the powder adapter isn't so suited for that, but we can certainly adapt uh, a, a test machine to run an abrasive wear test. 
a powder abrasive wear test. And the person who asked that question, maybe you can send me a short um, email with the subject abrasive testing with multi-specimen machine. And uh, I'll, I'll be able to send you some details about that. It's a little bit difficult to explain it without without images. So, uh, but we can we can do something there. Yes. Great. Well, um, we are past uh, eleven, and it looks like uh, that that other question uh, that I can get clarification on. So, uh, at this point, uh, you know, if you anyone has further questions, please reach out to um, Dirk or Mike, and they will answer yep. your questions through their emails there. Uh, look forward to their presentation chapter two in February. And so before we wrap up, Mike or Dirk, do you have anything you would like to say? i just like to thank everybody once again for their attention and uh, look forward to hearing from them and seeing how we can help them in the future. I couldn't have said it any better, Mike. Greetings from Europe tonight. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, again, look for the recording tomorrow. And we appreciate your time and uh, your attention.